on today's episode of Life Embodied. You know, growth comes in fits and spurts, and sometimes it feels like you're getting, you know, you're handling things worse, and then you're handling things better, and then you have this big insight, or you have this big healing, and then you see things differently and feel things differently. Um, for me, despite or throughout all of that, one thing that has shocked me is that, oh, conditioning stays. Conditioning changes really slowly. Mm. I've had awakening experiences. I've had a near death experience. I've had, um, I, I used to spend two to three hours a day meditating for 10 years. Um, and I've done lots of really long meditation retreats. I've had like really, you know, like awakening experiences that left me mm. without a sense of self, without a sense of self mm. other, like I've, I've gone far with that <laughs> kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> to a point where it took me once six months to recover and have a sense of I again. Oh, fuck. Um, <laughs> but what stayed, what stayed, Catherine, was conditioning. Welcome to Life Embodied, where we explore how an embodiment practice can support us in meeting the challenges of life. How can we surf the waves of life deeply anchored in the safety of our bodies? How can we learn to trust our capacity to be with intense sensations and emotions? How can we cultivate body awareness and why does it matter? Episodes include interviews with experts and practitioners that bring their knowledge and passion and share practical tips for your everyday life. I am your host, Katharina Alf. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the conversation. Welcome, everybody, to today's episode. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to point you to my online course, Compass, which starts in the middle of November and is a 30-day journey all about understanding symptoms, understanding your body's language, starting to communicate more effectively with your body, and using symptoms as a compass for authentic self-expression. So if you have tension or pain that you feel your body is trying to tell you something with, but you don't know how to begin to understand this, this course is for you. And you can find it on my website, which is katharinaalf.de, and then you find it under slash compass. And now let's dive into today's episode. My guest is Dylan Newcomb. Dylan is an embodiment coach and the founder and teacher of the Uzazu Embodied Intelligence Method. His background is in dance performance and music composition. In 2001, he co-founded the Dance Lab Institute for Movement Research, where he researched the relationship between vocal sounds, breath, movement and behavior. This laid the foundation for the development of Uzazu. Dylan is based in Freeport, Maine. What I didn't know is that he is actually quite fluent in German, as you will notice in the interview. This is the most practical episode yet. In the second half, Dylan shares a demo for you to join. So if you have the chance, I highly recommend to go to YouTube for this episode to not only listen, but also watch. Let's begin. Welcome, Dylan, to Life Thank Embodied. You. <laughs> Such a pleasure to have you, and it's nice to meet you. Likewise, likewise. I'm honored to be a guest. <laughs> Thanks. So the very first question that I ask my guests is, what is it like being your body? Maybe specifically today, maybe in general, what is the experience, the physical experience of being you? Mm. I noticed that you frame it, you didn't say being in your body, but you said being your body. Yeah. I assume that was a conscious choice. Yeah. <laughs> it is a conscious choice, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because that's different, right? Yeah. And, and, and if you don't mind, I'd like to answer it from the point of view of highlighting that distinction. Please do, by all means, yeah. When I think of what's it like being in my body, which is a much more typical Western frame of somebody starting to get into embodiment. Mm -hmm. right? The initial thing is, oh, I have a body. My body has feelings. My body has energy. Those are affecting my thoughts and behaviors. 
ah, I want to be in my body, meaning I think generally implicitly when we say being in my body, having more awareness in my body, like the, the eye that has awareness can be conscious of what's going on in the body more. Right. Yeah. So, oh, I am, I'm not just in my mind. I'm not just my behaviors. I, I guess then implicitly I as awareness or as conscious processes also inhabits this body. Yeah. But how you frame the question to me is, oh, and that's great, right? That gives me more awareness. It gives me more of my truth, more of my authenticity that I can be more grounded, more realistic, more authentic, more in dialogue with where my ganze sein, my whole being is, is present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you ask the question, what is it like to be, what, how did you say it? To be your body? To be your body. Yeah. Yeah. That's a more radical question, right? Um, from the point of view of, you know, Western mentality. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's definitely the intention because I think this being in your body really invites to stay in your head and yes. as if look at your body. Genau, yeah. This, this, this yeah, that tilting, tilting the perception downwards in a way. <laughs> Yes. Looking yes. at perceiving. Which is not wrong. I mean, there's, there's, that's an no. absolute place and a value for that. Yeah. 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 And I think it's, it's, it, I mean, it is on purpose that I ask, what is it like being your body? Since I'm talking to practitioners and experts, yeah, I think yeah. that's a question that yes. doesn't freak them out. <laughs> from, a, from a sort of academic standpoint, it's also the, the difference of the question that embodied That, that cognitive neuroscience frames, what is it like to put attention on the body? They would mm -hmm. more ask that. Embodied cognitive neuroscience, gate davon aus, you know, sort of assumes that, no, no, wait a minute. C cognition itself is an emergent property of the mind-body environment connection, right? Mm -hmm. So the embodied cognitive neuroscience standpoint or, or departure point is, no, wait a minute, Awareness, cognition, reflection, generation of experiences and our understandings at all sort of levels of them from the most qualitative proto-cognitive standpoint, all the way to more elaborate thoughts are, an, are emergent of the mind-body environment connection. And we just don't, because we have such a long history at this point of this sort of Descartian, I think, therefore I am, that yeah. we still, even those of us in the profession of embodiment, routinely, I think, are biased to unconsciously fall back into that bias, that huge bias of being located here, right? And yeah, body this yeah, and I think, I think we really... I have. Yeah. And I think we still kind of miss the language, right? Or we have to make it up. And then we have our own distinct vocabulary like that, that belongs to our work maybe or our perspective. But in general, we lack the vocabulary to address this. Yes. Yes. Um, so as a body now, now to actually try to yeah. just like answer your question already. Um, <laughs> as a body. As a body, I feel my impulses. And here I am owning them as if they're separate from me. See, it's so built into the language. But <laughs> there are impulses mm -hmm. that are felt. <laughs> there are urges. There are, on the yin receptive side, there are qualities that, are, that fill awareness the feeling of being with you, of getting to know you, the, the embodied curiosity of who is this being that I'm connecting with and interacting with. And there's the energy that I bring to the call, to this conversation, you know, just my day so far, my where I'm at in my life right now, just all the, all the energy of those things. Um, mm. And implicitly, there's all of the 
my patterning, my conditioning, the pathways that I have frequented and the pathways that I avoid, right? All of my, con all of my conditioning is my embodiment is using that, that foundation to operate <laughs> in the moment. And so that's uh, what I'm going to notice, how I'm going to respond to it. All of that is very, comes from a very grounded place. And I'm not saying I'm particularly grounded. I'm just saying we are grounded in that. Yeah. <laughs> and we are, that's how we roll. That's how we moment to moment. It's the, it's the ground floor of mm -hmm. meeting the moment in the relative world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I am, uh, I am that. And that's not all of when I say I, I don't, you know, that's not all of the I, but it's mm -hmm. the ground of it. It's mm -hmm. the ground of being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. land for you? What, where do you go with that? Um, I, I really related to the description of the, the yin aspect of experience. Like there is kind of this almost like background of qualities, maybe mm. that everything else drops into or emerges from or yeah. relates with, but as if almost as if a mood or something that is very passive, that's a state in a way that can be shifted but it is kind of the, yeah, the mood, the atmosphere, the quality of experience. Yes. It's a, it's a very valuable distinction, I think, to frame it like this. And um, yeah, and I mean, I definitely relate to what you mentioned about the, the background, the past, the conditioning, um, and... I think that this is something that's not easy to perceive because it's so it shows up when it is um, activated or yes. pulled, pulled up from the storage, something like that. <laughs> right. We, we, we get to know it from the, from the traces that it leaves. Yeah. Yeah. So in a way this, um, this really uh, um, is a is a wonderful entrance into what I actually wanted to to ask you first, because there is this difference of if we work with embodiment or if we use embodiment as a tool. Whatever, there we go, language. Oh my god, um, <laughs> <laughs> and we have we have different possibilities and. There is this level of shifting states, which yeah. would be more like maybe working with emotions that come up or moods that come up or like, oh, I'm super nervous. Okay, I shift my states towards more groundedness or sure. I'm super tired. I shift my states towards yes. more activation. Yes. And then there is this other layer of deep transformation where like, Ooh, these traces, as you just called them, keep being activated in a not so helpful way, maybe. Right. Conditioned how can I? Yeah. So how to how to work with this layer? And I think I think you in your work you do both. Very much. Exactly. Yeah. And I would be interested to to yeah, if you would elaborate a little bit on this, like how you perceive these two layers. Yes. Or how they also in, in, are interconnected and how you address yeah. this. All right. Great. Getting right, right into it. I love it. Um, but, however, before I answer that, I'd like to make one more distinction about the more in the moment state shifting. Sure. Yeah. I find, I found over the years of working with so state I understanding and being able understanding the different types of states that we are in energetically nervous system attentionally emotionally has been maybe the sort of leading tip of the spear of my work for the last 20 years is just developing and researching and validating frameworks for understanding different states I think you're aware of this, but for anybody you know who's new to my work, mm -hmm. I just wanted to frame like this is 
<laughs> I've been really working on this problem for a while. Um, <laughs> and working with so many people for so many years on this notion of states, I've one thing that's really been a lesson to me is that if we just focus on when we when we get interested in states and we start to become more skillful in oh i can shift my state there's this almost inevitable period where we go through of being kind of we we get inspired we get more hopeful and then we can start to get almost over ambitious when it starts to work like oh so I can shift my, we start to feel a little headstrong with our, our newfound power. Like, oh, so I can shift my state into any state. And, and if I need to do this, then I can shift my state and I can do it. And we get almost like, like, a, like that egocentric, you know, eight-year-old or 10-year-old that has a little bit of knowledge and then thinks that they're going to conquer the world, you know, and the parents are like, there's a lot you don't know yet. <laughs> and the kid's like, I can do this. Um and that is great because it gives us more agency. It gives us more capacity to not just be a victim of the moment, but to, yeah. to lean in in a way that is intentional, but also integrative, right? That it's not just trying to do it all with our mind, but our mind now saying, oh, uh, my body needs to be on board. And when I can get my body on board, that's great. But it's really important to recognize that that's still a top-down thing. It's still my mind telling my body what to do, how to feel. I'm just getting better at it. Yeah. It's really good to get better at it. <laughs> because if I'm going to do that thing, it's better that my body is aligned with that. Yeah. Right? So I'm not like, oh, but I'm actually there. Or I'm not like, mm, I'm listening to you, but I'm actually there. Right? It's going to yeah. be better. You're going to have better outcomes. It's going to be more sustainable. Blah, blah, blah. We know that. But... <laughs> The equal and opposite to that is, of course, listening to where we are already and honoring that. That's sort of the, sort of the yin and the yang of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, wait a minute, maybe I'm not in a state right now to keep pressing forward with this thing, or it's not the time to have that difficult conversation with my partner, right? Like, whatever it is, noticing where am I at right now? And then it's the wisdom to know the difference. Should I assert myself to change my state? Or should I honor my state where it's at and choose activities that are a little bit more aligned or attuned with that? Or and 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 it's not black or white. Maybe maybe mm. I'm going to honor this low energy state. I'm going to optimize it a little bit, and then I'm going to do something that complements it. Mm -hmm. So I just really wanted to put that out there because I feel that when we're talking about state mastery in the moment. It's really easy to get more sort of yang assertive with state mastery, but there's this sort of yin self-compassion side of state mastery, which is honoring our states, not just shifting them. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's really beautiful. We can go on to the deeper question of repatterning, but I just wanted to pause there for a moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's beautiful. I like the pauses <laughs> so, <laughs> to not rush from one thing to the next because usually like yeah it's it's so so rich like answers are so yeah, yeah exactly these are each huge topics <laughs> yeah yeah and I, like one thing that just came to mind um that i think might be super relatable for women <laughs> but it just came to my mind so strongly when you just when you when you um explained this is um uh throughout our cycle we have so often the question of do i do I now shift out of this state <laughs> or do I need to embrace this state? And I think so far the strategy um, was for most of us to, to push through to kind of, okay, now you need, you know, like you need to snap out of the passivity or the need to rest or the, and, right. and it's such a, it's, it's, It's a very new idea to actually give into those states and to be like, okay, maybe this is really important. Maybe I really need to withdraw, to rest, to listen to yeah. my inner messages. And yes. um, as not just something to cope with, but also is there even like, what's the opportunity of this state? Yeah. Right. Like yin cycles are an opportunity to integrate to rejuvenate, to 
process and resolve tensions. Like there's so much that is wanting to happen in those yin cycles um, yeah. that then fuel more organically vibrant, productive yang cycles. Yeah. And so when we say yes to our state, we're saying yes, not to just the experience of it. So we're not resisting it, but we say, we start to say yes to all the potential of it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to offer too many <laughs> uneducated advice about how that applies to the moon cycle, but, uh, but I've it is a cycle, right? Um, yeah. 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 And I, and I think, um, I think it's just one of the cycles and, and all cycles are circular, you know, like <laughs> yes, productivity exactly. cycles and all of that. Yeah. yeah. I just, I just noticed this shift in at least my social bubble towards more, awareness of the menstrual cycle and i think yeah, it is inspiring many people on many layers to not just apply this knowledge to the menstrual cycle but actually to all kinds of cycles or to invite a more cyclical thinking perception into life in general yeah yeah and and with that another huge one arguably even larger one is the circadian rhythms right yeah that i say larger just because that's <laughs> transgender yeah trans <laughs> above all genders um uh an example i've just started uh at the advice of andrew huberman who you know <laughs> many people are coming to appreciate uh, what he's offering um of delaying taking any caffeine for the first 90 minutes of my day and it's really made a noticeable shift to honor the 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 process of my body getting into gear And how can mm -hmm. I support that to happen in the mornings in an organic way rather than quickly taking some caffeine and sort of rushing it into gear? Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. more technical aspects to that of the chemicals and the processes, but that's essentially what it comes down to is like supporting mm -hmm. an organic shifting of state, right? Into the more active mode of the day. Yeah. To not yank yourself out of waking up. <laughs> right. Right. Or take a sleeping pill and slam yourself into calming down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So right. um, maybe back to the, to the, to the initial question you asked, yeah. which is, so we've got states. Let me see if I reflect it back to you uh, in a productive way for where you wanted to go mm -hmm. with this. Um, we've got our states in the moment and are in, through embodiment practices and learnings leaning into the questions the dual questions as i frame them of how can, on one hand how can i shift my state in in a in a holistic integrated way to better meet what the moment is asking of me whether it's what is wanted of me or what i'm wanting to do yeah and And at the same time, how can I understand my state in a compassionate way? What is my body needing? What would meet me where I'm at? And the ongoing, you know, no one right answer, of course, but the ongoing wisdom cultivation of when to do, how much of which. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a beautiful set of inquiry and one that can, you know, we can be busy with for our whole life, obviously. Yeah. Um, And all of that is happening within the context of our current development, our current conditioning, our sensory motor conditioning, the pathways that we've exercised and have become very well-worn myelinated pathways. Like some people are really quick and they do anger really easily. Other people, they will avoid anger till the very last minute and it blows up or, or just gets repressed Mm -hmm. um, other people are really quick to compassion, almost too quick to it and not standing up for themselves. Mm -hmm. Some people are really good at yinning. Other people are really good at yanging, but not as good at yinning, right? So we have our habits in other words. Yeah. And often, as you know, so well, I think, uh, those habits, not always, but often have some, um, some trauma around them, um, which let's just say complicates it. And, um, <laughs> But not all of it. Some of it is just habits, you know, and those habits um, are a product of our, our, our magic, mysteriously complex. Like who can claim to know how many different influences have, have caused those habits to shape as they have. Mm. 
right? You can talk about souls and soul journeys. You can talk about personality. You can talk about astrology. You can talk mm -hmm. about family constellations and first child and second child and third child. You can talk about ancestry. You can talk about DNA. You can talk about socioeconomic factors. Like the list is endless of all the things that contribute to that and are worth looking into. And mm -hmm. many of those schools will, I think, make overinflated claims about how, how much influence the thing that they focus on has, <laughs> you know, yeah. like the astrology people are like, it's all astrology. And other people are like, it's not at all astrology. And, <laughs> um, and the ancestry people will be like, it's all just, you know, these waves of, of conditioning that get passed down. And that's the key. Mm. I find, I love it all. I find it all fascinating endlessly. Mm. And my inclination is to honor all of it and to say, I, I'm sure it all has a significant influence. Hmm. You know, we each are, and I, I sort of feel it's my nature to kind of want to understand it all, which is both a blessing and a curse. Um, <laughs> so I've ended up becoming quite the geek, I guess, in, in the last 20 years, studying a lot of it and trying to find ways to make sense so that it's not so overwhelming. Yeah. But that there's a sense of why would I want to focus on what aspect of what's contributing to my conditioning? When? When would I look from mm -hmm. a developmental standpoint? When would I look at ancestry? When would I look at trauma? Uh, Instead of just, yeah. oh, no, it's all about trauma. Or, oh, no, it's all about this. Yeah. Um, but what I do, what I will say, if I... As, as I'm on my own journey of growth and as he, waves of lots of my, you know, so it's such a growth is such an iterative, mysterious, organic journey. Um, I've had like many people that have been leaning into this for themselves intently for many years, you know, growth comes in fits and spurts. And sometimes it feels like you're getting, you know, you're handling things worse and then you're handling things better. And then you have this big insight or you have this big healing and then you see things differently and feel things differently. Um, for me, despite or throughout all of that, one thing that has shocked me is that, oh, conditioning stays. Conditioning changes really slowly. Hmm. I've had awakening experiences. I've had a near death experience. I've had, um, I, I used to spend two to three hours a day meditating for 10 years. Um, and I've done lots of really long meditation retreats. I've had like really, you know, like awakening experiences that left me mm -hmm. without a sense of self, without a sense of self mm -hmm. other, like I've, I've gone far with that <laughs> kind of stuff. <laughs> to a point where it took me once six months to recover and have a sense of I again. Oh, fuck. um, <laughs> But what stayed, what stayed, Catherine, was conditioning. And that was the biggest shocker to me. Like even when a sense of self, of individual I is gone, the shocker, and, I, and then I, you, know, you read that and you say, oh, everybody else is saying this too. But you, we can get so fixated on this notion of like, ah, if I just have this breakthrough, if I just go through this process, da, 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 then it's just going to be clean sailing and I'm not gonna have limiting beliefs and, and I'm just gonna <laughs> respond appropriately to everything. <laughs> that is so so incredibly rare that that happens to anybody like you can count i think on on very few hands and fingers uh and toes how many people conditioning has been erased for. like you can have a lot of it be cleaned up quickly but conditioning stays that's a long process oh yeah what what changes is our relationship to it right and our stories about it yeah, can I can I jump in quickly? Please, because please. I this is such. A, uh, thanks for sharing also the your experiences that many people would probably think what would interrupt conditioning, and that you that you noticed or that you experienced that it's not the case, um, because this is something that that I've been thinking about recently because I, I I've had a couple of quite. Uh, quite good transformational moments in the last uh, years or month or whatever. Yeah. Like, like Congratulations. The, good, the good ones, the good, the good therapy sessions where you're like, Shit, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, like this unraveled nicely. Um, <laughs> now oh, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, 
only to notice later on that, like you say, the conditioning is not gone. Like there are insights, super valuable insights in how you came to be the way you are or or why or, you know, like on all the levels that you just mentioned um, of like, yeah, oh, my ancestors or a, or just very profane, my parents, you know, <laughs> like, um, all of these layers and, and things and, and to and then still to to observe yourself behaving in the same way again. And Humbling, like, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like a couple of years ago, I would have said like, as soon as someone says like, ah, this is just the way I am, or I just tend to be this or that, I would be like, that's just lazy. That's just an excuse. Like if you already know you are, this way then go ahead and change it but right now i feel like in a more like yeah right now i'm in the state of or stage or whatever it is of like no i think there is this level of accepting that you are just a certain way on some levels and it's good to know this about yourself and to be aware of it but it might not be changeable and it might also not be the goal to change it Because, like, I, I'll give an example. Because what something that I noticed about myself is that I'm, that I, I, I'm easily excited. Like, I easily fall in love. I'm easily excited about things, about ideas, about people. And I'm always like, if I, if I like something, I'm, I tend to go like, this is the best thing ever. You know? <laughs> like, oh my god! And now yeah. I'm on, gonna do only this, and you know, and I, and I, yeah. I fell for this many, many times, and. The, the waking up from it was painful, not only once. And, but, but it doesn't change. I'm still easily excited. <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of got to know myself in this better. And yeah. now whenever I get overly excited, I'm like, oh, I think I'm overly excited again. Like, let's give this a day or two. Or like, let's take a breath with, breath with this and not yeah, yeah. rush into things or make conclusions. Or let's yeah. see what I'll say tomorrow about this. And not okay. take everything I think so seriously. Yeah, yeah, lovely. <laughs> Makes a big difference, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. And, and the realization that I... I, I find at the, at the core of this notion of self-development, lass mal sagen, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. uh, are, are, are several core sort of paradoxes where equal and opposite things are both true. Like on one hand, you are who you are, And change is always possible mm -hmm. a little bit, you know, something we could play with the articulation of it, but that kind of thing, right? The yeah. sort of timeless essence of Dylan and Catherine, you know, this is our essence, this is our nature and incremental and sometimes quick and radical and surprising mysterious change is also possible. And how do we, how do we accept both? How do we, lean into both how do we honor both in a way that they become more supportive apparently contrasting contradicting realities that they become a kind of um at first they become for a long time and in many ways they're they're part of our unconscious internal battle then they start to become a kind of a koan or right? a kind of a more conscious paradox that we're like but i'm starting to like in our conversation like we're starting to lean into how they're both true mm -hmm. and then we can start to go how can they actually coexist in a in a in a mutually supportive way right so what would that be like i don't know in in the context of what we're talking about right now like i am who i am and i accept like even if i never were to change mm. can i say hallelujah to that too <laughs> Yeah. That I don't make who I, my essence, 
and my love of it conditional on the plan that I have for my growth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good because I know I'm going to do this thing that's going to make me better. <laughs> Some yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a, a big part of it is also to, um, or a big shift can be, or what we can change is how we look at ourselves, like in the how we address the unchangeable bits or the 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 built-in bugs yeah or that we become kinder with ourselves or yes more patient more humor <laughs> exactly exactly uzazu embodied intelligence is the name of the modality that i've been developing over the last 20 years and and what it is or one of the things that it really offers is a, a very kind of full spectrum framework for understanding states. Mm -hmm. And we, so we have nine, eight core states with a ninth one, which is sort of like the neutral middle um, that is kind of like where we are when we're not in any of these more, you know, biased states. And with each of those states, we look at them in three, what we call activation states, which is Balance. This is when you're really doing it, when I'm really connecting empathically with you or when I'm really leaning into my and discovering my full potential. Und so weiter, und so weiter. And then we look at it, so that's its balanced state. Hey, this is the good state and its benefits. Then we look at it in its underactivated form. What is it when the moment my mind or the environment is inviting me into that state, but for whatever reason, I don't feel like it's safe or okay to go there. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's not okay to really let myself feel our connection. It's not okay for me to really share my truth. It's not okay for me to really deliver and share my value with somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And that's usually conditioning, right? That has taught us that that's not safe for whatever reason, or we drew those conclusions. Yeah. And again, tons of factors that can continue to that. So that's kind of one class of conditioning. We could say the conditioning that is there to protect us from mm -hmm. danger, Right, mm -hmm. that we've learned what is safe for us to do, what what is safe for us to feel and be, and what is not. And then there's what we call the overactivated states, which is mm -hmm. when I go to do something, I kind of do it too much. I connect too intently, or I, <laughs> share, you know, I, I, I'm a little grandiose with my self-expression and my construction of myself, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, what is it that causes us to push too far in a certain direction to overdo it? Why yeah. do we have that compulsion and that miscalibration, that misevaluation of how much is needed? Yeah. yeah. One question um, so about this. Is this is a very s simple yet helpful framework to also look at conditioning, right? Not just what's our conditioning, but how has our conditioning supported us to access states in a, in a well-balanced way that's appropriate for the moment? What yeah. are our habits of what states that our conditioning is causing us to not access and not arrive in fully and how has our conditioning caused us to overdo certain things or overuse certain states? yeah yeah because you just used the terms of you definitely said over activation i don't know if you said un under activated voila both yeah yeah and i think this is this is something that 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 Like these are terms that many people use these days because the the polyvagal theory becomes more and more common knowledge and yes. people are very much into nervous systems and their own nervous systems and regulation. And um, I think you are using these terms in a different way than like nervous system activation. And maybe you can differentiate a little bit like what Thank I you for that. that. Yes, yes. Very, very well spotted. So. A more typical use of overactivation, underactivation has to do with arousal level and sympathetic nervous system stimulation, i.e. high arousal. Yeah. I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, but they're very highly correlated with each other, right? When my sympathetic nervous system kicks in, that brings my energy level up, my focus level up, right? And then you have in, in emotions and affect states, you have the high arousal emotions, Right. So your desire, your joy, your fear, your anger, but also your righteous anger, your pride, your uh, uh, guilt uh, will bring us up into this got to do something space. Right. Mm -hmm. Whether it's positive or negative, there's a sense of got to do something. Um, that's 
when people say high activation or over activation or stimulation, they often mean that the body is overstimulated. Yeah. And then low activation. Again, this is not my framing, but this is the traditional framing. And then I'll contrast my framing. Low activation is often associated with, can be a combination of two things, not enough sympathetic activation when it mm -hmm. would be helpful and mm -hmm. often an overactivation of the parasympathetic nervous system. So in other words, not enough gas, too much brake <laughs> in our car, right? So it's like, uh, and so that is causing us to, which leads to, of course, lethargy, depression, ultimately can lead their um, hypersensitivity, victimhood, that we just feel like I can't. Yeah. Right? And then everything just sort of feels like it, it waits, the world waits down upon us. And that's mm. under activation. That's not how I mean it. Um, <laughs> how I mean it is simply relative to a certain way of being and doing. Mm. Like there are certain ways of being and doing archetypally that are needed in life. And we and Uzazu just looks at eight, what we call modes of embodied engagement. And relative to each mode, do I have the, am I doing not enough of it, a good amount of it, or too much of it yeah. of that state? So like a, a synonymous thing would be, what we call gateway posture or um, constructive self-efficacy, self-esteem. Do I have a positive self-esteem that is supporting me to dream and idea, have ideas about myself and what I can do? And that yeah, requires. Can you, can you explain a bit of of um, for the people that are just listening what you do physically right now? Right. Because it's, a, it's an yeah, important. Yeah, exactly. Point. So I'm straightening up through my spine. I'm 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 fanning my arms out into a kind of a large space off to the side. I'm holding a kind of almost like a halo or a crown out from my hands, like a big gateway or a, a, a sun. And there's mm. just the sense of, I expand and in Uzazu, then we bring vowel sounds into it that mirror this posture. So that would be, ah, yeah. Ah. Ah. And I allow myself to, you know, radiate up and out. So now my body is supporting my mind and my attention to hold this wide space of what could be possible, right? Mm -hmm. And I could be doing that too much, pushing it too much, where I start to get a little overinflated, a little, yeah, I could do this and then I could do that and I could be the best embodiment teacher in the world. And Uzazu is definitely the best technique, in, you know? <laughs> <laughs> <It's the trick. laughs> Look at me. Right, so I no longer need to be just... Um, Good. I need to be the best. Yeah. This would and this would how people would spot this in themselves. Yeah. So it would be a need to be exceptional. A need mm -hmm. to be exceptional. Not mm -hmm. like good is not good enough. You know, mm -hmm. great is only mm -hmm. acceptable. Mm -hmm. Um. And then this is also connected or uh, a tendency to overinflate or to, to um, in Dutch, we say oplöke, um, to like make it a little bit more than it was. Like, so you embellish on stories to make it seem to come yeah. across even better. Yeah. So when you notice you have a tendency to like, it wasn't just a good weekend. It was an amazing weekend. Yeah. Übertreiben in German. Übertreiben. Yeah. Yeah. Genau. Yeah. yeah. Over-exaggerate. Yeah. Um, Why are we doing that, right? Mm. There is a need to be perceived as uniquely valuable, right? I'm not fully accepting. My self-esteem needs a boost from your admiration. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it's like I'm, I'm, I'm signing you up to be my vitamin supplement <laughs> for my own <laughs> self-esteem. <laughs> <sighs> but you didn't sign up for that job necessarily so i'm just feeding you a kind of a distorted view of my reality so that you'll give me that <laughs> <laughs> and we all do it don't we i mean it's let's forgive ourselves for that um so that's anyway i'm getting into a lot of detail here but maybe it's good to just give an example of how this can play out yeah um, now that's a that's a that's a that's a activated state Mm -hmm. becoming even more overactivated. But we can look at overactivation in the in the sensing direction rather than the acting direction. Yeah. So 
if I look at, for example, let's take the very opposite one. So that's when I go back into myself and wide and I'm really, that supports me to get into my own self-esteem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if I go down, if I soften my body down into my sensing and I lean forward, Mm -hmm. so I'm really giving, putting the attention on you rather than on myself. Uh And then I go narrow. So I'm really just tuning into you and being present to you and how it feels to be with you. So the hands come in front of the body. I'm putting my hands in front of my body. I'm turning my palms up so that they can receive and I'm Mm -hmm. pointing them at you. So in other words, my body is now like a shaped according to how I want my attention to be shaped. Right. So I'm shaping my body similar to how I want my attention to be shaped. Uh So uh it, it supports it both supports the shape of my attention and allows my attention to be more naturally somatically grounded and in, in a feedback loop. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I'm doing that, I could do that to a good degree. Like, mm -hmm. and this helps me like before I came on the call with you, Mm -hmm. I was busy with a bunch of things. And so I took a moment to look at the screen before I pressed enter Mm -hmm. and I just softened down and forward in here. Mm -hmm. And I looked forward to meeting you. Mm-hmm. So when I arrived on the call, I was more here rather than, hey, nice to meet you, uh, you know, sort of distracted and frazzled. Yeah. Um, but I could do that. I could overactivate that. That's the point that I'm getting to. So yeah. I will show it for the video people, but then I will describe it for mm-hmm. the audio people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could be here, but then I could go too far down. Mm-hmm. I could go too far forward and too far narrow. And if I'm overactivating this state, how are you? It's so good to see you. Oh, how are you feeling? Yeah. And I'm, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to connecting with you in this call and, and just really seeing how you, anyway, you, right, where I become fixated on the quality of your and the nature of your thoughts and your feelings and how they relate to mine and feeling very precious and kind of a little bit overly fixated on that. Not only is that a little suffocating and a little over intense and a little in <laughs> But I lose conscious, I lose connection with myself. Yeah. So what to put to summarize and put it into perspective, when we use overactivated and underactivated just to talk about the parasympathetic nervous system, that's okay. That's mm. absolutely fine, of course. It, it, it's got its relevance. I find it really helpful language to talk about over and under in terms of a whole range of Mm -hmm. states Um, because then we can be that much more discerning about what as for our own growth and for supporting others and mm, what might serve this person, that person to do more of or to do less of. Yeah. And then we can start to lean into how to support that. Mm -hmm. And again, because there's the, on the back to our frame of like the states in the moment versus the longer conditioning embodiment gives us, Uzazu gives us, but other techniques have their ways of doing it, of noticing those states and training people to, to notice those states and then to shift them in the moment. Mm. The degree to which our conditioning is ready to allow us to go there and right, because some people I'll train them to be like to go from over activated bridge, like they have a tendency, and a lot of helping professionals have this tendency, mm-hmm. right? Which is why we got into it in the first place <laughs> of being a little anxiously attached to our clients, right? And um, <laughs> we care about them and we want them to be happy. And um, so we can learn to do that, and that's great, and that can give us so much benefit, meaning we can learn to pull back from that more over-attentive and mesh state and, and, and stay somatically connected with ourself. And that's, yeah. you, can make, you can help somebody make a lot of progress really quickly that way. And at the same time, if they've got early childhood trauma about being abandoned, right, a lot of their system is still going to be lurching forward to that don't leave me place that is really deep in them. And it's going to cause them to over attend to other people because of those attachment wounds. And you're, you're not going to change that just by teaching somebody to shift their state a little bit back out of that. Yes. But you will give them an incredibly useful reference point. So now they know when they're doing it, when they're not doing it, they can even correct it. 
Mm. But kind of like if you go to a chiropractor who's really good at getting your back in, but you find that you've been going to the chiropractor for four years and they're still putting that thing back into your spine. And then you start to go, maybe I need to go to some physical therapy or something a little deeper because he's just, he's just help. I'm just paying him to help me reset all the time. Yeah. So Uzazu is great for doing your own state chiropractics, <laughs> you know, for, for doing those little shifts. And again, there's other techniques for state shifting. Um, I'm referencing, you know, the one I know. Um, so it's a great combination. In other words, we want to do the deeper therapeutic trauma and ancestral work. And we want to be able to do the immediate state shifting because life is always messy because we'll never be perfect. Like they need each other. Sure. And do you find that when you teach people for it, like, st let's stay with this example of like, there is this, they, they are like over, overly activated into, you call it bridge pose, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, bridge where the, the hands are, are in, in, in front of the body. They're leaning towards the, their, their, uh, gegenüber, their partner. To the their, other. Yeah. To the other. Uh, there is kind of this round back even. So this would be the gesture bridging towards yeah. the other. Yes. And if they're like overly activated into this position and they're kind of, as you, as you described it, like anxiously trying to hold on to the connection. Do you experience that when you, that first of all, I mean, people have to become aware of this. Right. Yeah. They don't probably are not aware at first that this is what they right. do. So it is already kind of a diagnosis to find out, ah, so this is what And I'm insight doing. Insight awareness generating journey. That's, that's the first gift yeah. of it. Yeah. And, and then you, you show them the options of like, like physically exploring this state and then like gently, possibly gently, like moving out of it a little bit or going yeah. backwards or, I can imagine that when doing this, a lot of stuff comes up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Like I mean, <laughs> yes. It, it depends person to person on how sure. much trauma that that issue is related to, how well contained, repressed, or managed that trauma is, right? You mm -hmm. know, there's some people, their, their stuff just boom, it comes up. Other people, it's going to take maybe a year or two to get there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, different practitioners, some people like have ways of, and are focused on really leaning in and eliciting it. Other people, you know, are more focused on the organic process of it's going to come up when it's ready to come up. There's different, you know, views mm -hmm. on some people are more assertive vis-a-vis -vis trauma mm -hmm. and other people are more gentle and organic and gradual with it. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, to your point, uh, yes, stuff can come up. <laughs> and I'm, I guess I'm just adding that there is stuff related to it. How much of it comes up? How much are they able to let come up? How much do they just not have control over it coming up? Mm -hmm. All of these kind of factors. Um, But like, I, th I think what I'm also um, asking is like, there, 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 there will be not with everybody, but with many people, I imagine there will be the opportunity for really deep transformational work right there. So that when they come out of overly bridging towards the other and they, and they physically experiment with coming out of this, that wow, the old fear is coming back of like, ah, but I can't leave this position. Oh my God, I feel I'm going to die. And then you can kind of process it right there. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, I, I've, I'm at risk of um, doing some really like anti bad marketing for my own modality right now. But I will say that me 10, 15 years ago would have answered that question a little bit more enthusiastically. Like, yes, that's why Uzazu and embodiment is so powerful and we can bring people into these states and they can have these amazing quick transformations. And, and that's not, you know, 15 years later, I'll say, and, and several hundred, uh, several thousand people later, I'd say, yeah, 
if I've learned anything, it's to be careful and cautious and slow. <laughs> Uh -huh. and and to err on the side of slow and gradual and safe <laughs> uh -huh. um because some some big big caveats and questions is is the person facilitating it adequately trained in dealing with the amount of trauma that could be unleashed mm -hmm. so as i'm training you know i'm a, now a modality i've shifted from being a practitioner to being a modality trainer mm -hmm. um and you get of course people that have a lot of trauma training and can handle what comes up. And then there's also people that are just naturally gifted at holding space, right. For mm. that kind of thing. So there's, there's a whole range there. And then there's the people that have the training and, and just aren't as naturally gifted at it. So like when the person has stuff come up, they still don't inherently feel safe with that practitioner, even though that practitioner sort of knows technically mm. what to do. I've seen this. I've watched so many videos of my students working with people. I've just seen it in action with so many different practitioners mm -hmm. that it's it, it's it's humbling, you know, the, the, to see what what can come up and what it what is involved in holding that skillfully. So anyway, my mm -hmm. point is. The thing that I encourage people to focus on, my students, when they're bringing people into early, especially in the early stage of their relationship with that client, right? Because there's, we, we go on a journey with our clients. Ultimately, we want to get to a set where we have a, a shared language, a shared set of skills and embodied resources. So when things come up, we can be like, ah, let's do that thing because this, this is coming up. So let's do that thing that we do that helps us process and handle it. If I bring somebody too quickly that I don't know that we don't have shared resources in, I don't know their capacity yet for working together with me in handling when that kind of stuff comes up. Like I see us building, building a shared capacity to process their stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a journey that we're on together. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's them meeting me and my modality and me training them, but it's also me meeting them. What are the skills that they already have, the resources that they already have? So I can be like, do that thing that you do, <laughs> you know, that helps you. Yeah. Um, the first gift of that, that I've, come to really focus on and encourage my students to focus on is when somebody doesn't, if it is that is the conscious recalibration of what to aim for. So if, if I'm naturally an over attached, like people pleasing in measure, <laughs> I tend to, I've come to feel like this and people can't necessarily all see me, but I'm like over leaning in and I'm over attentive to you right now. This will feel normal. Yeah. This will feel like connected. This will, yeah. and I don't have that reference of, oh, actually this is enough. A little bit back, a little bit more easeful, a little bit more balanced and attuning to myself and to you. Mm -hmm. And having people oscillate, toggle, we call it, toggle between the overactivated and the balanced, and then talking about it and sharing with other people and seeing other people do that starts to, one, normalize it. Like, oh, this is mm -hmm. something that we do and this is not this is just an overactivation of certain things. It's not a label of, oh, I'm a hopeless, you know, people pleaser. Like, yeah. yes, you have people pleasing tendencies and here's how they live in the body. And here's what it's like. Here's what balanced is. Your system doesn't feel safe there yet. Your, this, your system doesn't naturally calibrate around this yet. But it's getting to know this sense of this is what balanced feels like. That can't be understated the bat, the importance of that, because now the system has a new thermostat setting that it can start to, you know, calibrate the hot and the cold air around. Yeah. Right. A new set point to organize around and, and how long it takes that system to more and more naturally automatically organize around a little bit less over attentive is going to be different for different people, but now it has that. And that is, that's everything. Yeah. And yes, and, and sometimes you get lucky and they've already done a bunch of work or karmically they're ready for it. God knows, God only knows, or whatever only knows, the universe only knows. Um, sometimes amazing healing can happen and reorganize. Like it, it's always a gift when that happens. It's just like, yeah. 
you could feel it. The person, the whole body just goes like, oh, I was ready for that. I just didn't know how to access it. Yeah. Yeah. And stuff was ready to clear up. Mm -hmm. But we're not in control of how, you know, not, neither of us are in control of how ready we really are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said a little while back before I went into that, that I was at risk of like doing anti-marketing for, for embodiment <laughs> in, in my own modality. And so I want to circle back on that and, and say, to, to be clear, it's even, uh, you know, deshalb, all of that, despite all that, it's, it's still the fastest way I know. Like <laughs> if we're talking about, if we're talking about real authentic integrated change, which isn't just a habit shift or something that's relying on our ego strength to sort of mind, body, muscle our way into a better behavior that, that we maintain with effort, but that it just becomes our new normal, our new unconscious skillfulness. Mm. It is still the best. It's it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. It's just, it's, and we're going to have certain aspects of it that are going to happen really quickly. Yeah. And there's going to be other ones that are just that it's going to be a process, which brings us back to that polarity of like I am who I am, and 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 the work of like being okay with that, hmm. and continually leaning into hmm, what can be done here. <laughs> What's the next? iteration that I can lean into. Yeah. I, I love, I love, I, I feel called to say this. I, my background is in dance, dance and music. Um, so I spent many years, you know, learning, well, lots of styles of dance. I started with West African dance and uh, American folk dance. Um, so mostly folk dances of different kinds. And then I got into ballet, classical ballet and was in a ballet company. And so that was years of like really rigorous training. To, to learn to execute a move in ballet well, you're going to be doing it for, I don't know, at least six years, six to 14 years before you really get it. And that's doing it every day. Mm -hmm. And that's because the body takes time to, to really perfect stuff. It's slow. The mind understood what a pirouette was. It understood what a triple pirouette was after two weeks. Mm -hmm. But the body is going to take another six years to catch up. <laughs> And that requires, if you're not going to hate yourself for six years while you're still bad at doing the double pirouette, <laughs> you know, you better get used to the, it, it would serve you to have patience and compassion that the body and, and, and changing our, our muscle memory is a slow iterative process that requires repetition and practice. Hmm. Yeah. And one of the things with our Western mind centered mentality is we're used to like, you know, if you can understand it, then you have it. You know, that's sort of, ah, frustration. Like, yeah. no. <laughs> Does the body understand it? Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Where to go from here? I would like to go practical. Okay. The, the way I got to know your work so far is that it is really, it's so practical. It's so applicable to everyday life. Like it's very, you can, all, you can choose almost every challenge on, on every level of challenges there are <laughs> and address it with your tools. And in a way, there is kind of this assessment of, how am I doing <laughs> or no. where, where am I stuck or yes. um, what am I missing? What, and then, and then also what can I train? What do I need to become better at? Yes. And, um, and you already showed these two poses mm -hmm. and maybe you could lead us through the, through the full circle of the poses um, so that 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 the that me and the listeners can can experience the different poses, what they might feel like, and already get a taste of yeah, where they might where they might want to continue to explore or sure, sure. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of the most helpful way to do that. So I'll just, yeah, I'll just improvise this. So, <laughs> and thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm happy to, to say yes. Cool. Um, cool. Thank you. So I want to invite people, whether you're listening to this or you're seeing this, to kind of watch slash listen slash feel my body and my words as if it were you. Yeah. So sort of live into my body as if you're trying that much like when you, when you read a novel and a character saying something, you kind of like, you can't help but imagine what if I were that person and you're kind of living in their shoes in that moment. And as you're doing that, notice your responses to each of these posts. Notice which ones feel immediately like, Ooh, yummy. I want to be in that. Like your system just goes, yes. Mm -hmm. Either from a place of recognition, like, mm, I love that. Yes. That's, mm -hmm. or from a place of like, Ooh, I, I, there can be this kind of hunger that mm. can be a sign of, yes, I'm ready for that. And I want more of that state. Right. So there's, that's a distinction like, oh yeah, that that's been, a, you know, like that's, I know that one. Well, that's me. I recognize myself. And then there's the positive reaction of like, I, I want that, that gets me excited. And then there's the one of, Ooh, that feels I'm, I'm sick of doing that. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I do that or the way I'm doing that is not serving me or I'm doing it too much or I'm doing it uh, in a way that is causing tension. Uh, and then there's, that it just does not feel safe for me or that feels really foreign to me. It could just feel sort of foreign. You could even notice yourself kind of tuning out or you could notice yourself just being like almost triggered. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I just thought I'd put that out there. Like that, in other words, we can have a range of responses when we really notice and even watching somebody else do it, not doing it ourselves. Of course, these would be the same responses if when I invite people to do the postures for the first time that I'm inviting them to notice. As you said yourself in the beginning, doing structured embodiment practice is an invitation for increased self-awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Which of these states feel safe for me, mm -hmm. right? Uzazu is, in the beginning, it's, it's really a question of what embodied states does awareness feel safe to reside in? So when I'm bridging with you, does, is it safe for awareness to be in my body? When I'm sharing my truth, is it safe? for me to, for my awareness to live in my body as I do that. And where do I, because of my conditioning, I just have to make a choice, right? Either I stop doing the behavior and I come back to myself or I kind of dissociate to whatever degree and I'm, I force my way through it. Yeah. So with that said, hmm. I'm getting ready for those of you just listening. <laughs> I'm taking my jacket off, but not more. <laughs> um, hmm. Quick warm up. All right. So yeah, I'll just this will just be a taste. I won't try to uh, explain it all as we go through, but just let these so. Again, this is not a, a training, so don't try in your mind to go, oh, how can I learn this? Don't try to learn it, just experience it. So here I am in what we call neutral, where I'm just resting in the middle. I'm inviting myself to just be present. I'm just noticing what that's like, what my state, what my embodied qualities are like. I'm going to go back into myself. I'm going to soften down and I'm going to narrow into ooh, sponge embodied experiences. It's safe for me to feel my feelings. It's safe for me to feel this. And then I'm noticing. Hmm. To what degree does it feel safe and easy for me to just rest in and as this experience? Ooh. And I'm going to go wide. I'm going to hold space for my inner experience, what we call cradle mode or mindful self-compassion. Can I hold and sort of parent and contain 
my experience, my thoughts, my feelings in a way that is nurturing and not over controlling or judging, but nurturing. Ugh. Am I kind to myself with whatever's coming up? What do I need? What will support me? What will nurture me? Cradle, like we're cradling a baby or a kid. Mm. So now we start to, we're going to stay back in ourselves, but we're going to go up into action. So now we're here, we're sensing and receiving our experience. I'm going to go narrow and up. Right to here in front of my face. This is where I enter into a, a more assertive driving state. We call this pillar posture or empowered self-efficacy. This is the, I, I feel motivated to do this. I can do this. I believe in my capacity to do this or not, but I notice it. It's a test of my empowered conviction and clarity of intrinsically motivated purpose. <sighs> and by the way, these states, they're not like, oh, this, I can do this. I can't do this. They're very contextual. I might feel very empowered to do this when I think of one environment, but very triggered when I think of doing it in another environment. So it's always relative to what, right? And now, ah, I open that up wide. This is that gateway posture. Ah, I honor and accept myself as I am. Ah, and I allow myself to be seen by you and to share who I am all of my parts, past, present, and future. We could go that big. <sighs> ah, ah. There's so many different facets to these modes, but I'm just highlighting some of the main ones. Ah. And now from here, we're gonna go across the middle and through into neutral, through neutral into bridge. Mm -hmm. And so now these are the other focus ones. So I'm choosing to focus on you right now. And I think you're focusing on me. I could also do it with the room. I could do it with the water bottle. I could do it with the trees outside, right? I'm just focusing on someone or something external and letting myself drop in and really be present with that. We call this supportive connection. I'm just noticing what it really feels like to be emotionally present with and also really present to the qualities and feelings I get from you. And again, I'm noticing is awareness, how, where, and how is awareness, does it seem to have capacity to flow through this? Like, where am I pulling away or, and then a lot of affect tolerance in the beginning. Can I just breathe through that? Notice those tensions and breathe through that. So it starts to become more and more safe at this instinctive level, like, oh yeah, that's calm, that's good, this is okay. And then we're gonna widen that up to include the whole space. I'm gonna stay low, I'm gonna soften out. This is what we call field posture. I'm gonna allow lateral rotation. I'm gonna free up my neck and my ribs, my hips. And I'm gonna be fluidly oriented and present within the space. And we call this adaptive communion. Can I allow myself to really be present and responsive with the flow of what's happening without, and this one is the easiest one to check out and start to dissociate. In other words, is it safe for me to be fully present with everything here in this space? And do I, can I experience myself as belonging as part of this, not as just a witness to it, but as a drop of the water that is this ocean. E. And now we bring it up into channel. Brr. Brr. Channel is where I have a directed force that I'm directing out to make a desired impact on something else outside of me. It could be fulfilling purpose. It could be serving, right? It could be doing my job. It could be being a dad. Right? It could be enacting a role. <sighs> Am I able to achieve a positive effect for someone or something out there in a way that is organically connected to me and is sustainable value? Brr. 
her. A lot of our job and work and career and money are tied up in this pattern. And then we widen that out. Ah. And what we call the final one, which is similar to gateway, but it's forward, it's interacting playfully with the world. Ah. Can I interact with everything? Am I available to say yes and, like that wonderful comedy improv exercise, yeah, the yes and, to be in a co-creative, responsive dialogue of emergence. Like our conversation, right? You share some things, I share some things. We're like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Am I available to play and co-create with this community, with the world, with the future? <sighs> and then just to balance it, we're going to go all the way back to the sponge and fold back in on our body mind. Ooh. <sighs> to bring some much balancing yin to that more extreme yang of mesh. Ooh, and let it settle into the body. And then from that place, gently coming back to the middle to neutral. And just noticing what our state feels like now. Okay. So that was a quick tour through the through the nine modes. Mm, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, May I ask what you're what you're noticing right now? What your state is? I feel very awake right now, and I feel as if more gathered as if I collected some pieces of my attention that were scattered, mm, maybe. Mm, mm. Um, the room is much more in my awareness now than it was before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I definitely feel more flexible in... Or I don't know exactly how to phrase this, but I feel I, I do feel more connected with myself while connecting to you. Mm, mm, mm. Like almost as if more on eye level in a way. Mm. Nice. Yeah. A word we often use is available. Mm -hmm. By continually orienting back into the neutral and then going through states or into states and back to neutral, it's like we're massaging our range of motion state-wise. So it's like when the moment is inviting a bit of, hmm, our system's like, oh yeah, I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I was just there a moment ago, mm -hmm. right? Or if it's your turn to share something, you just practiced being assertive or being expressive. So your body, like your body mind is ready to, to use that pattern. One or two things I'd like to share on the tail end of people having gone through that. Mm -hmm. um, when you're dealing with that facet of embodiment, which is posture related or movement related, where it's like, I'm going to do this movement, which is related to these types of qualities. And we sort of, we've covered this a little bit, but I think it's important to tie back to it. It is very seductive to lead with them when you know that when you know that like a ah, gateway could help me to be to feel more free and expressive it's easy to then get sort of over attached to that in the mind and go okay i'm going to do this so that i can feel that mm -hmm. and that's great and it's really important to be authentic and honest with yourself though every step of the way so it's better to ask the question okay i know that this posture can help promote these kind of things. But I also, I'm going to remind myself that in the first place, it's an opportunity to evaluate compassionately how readily and easily when I move this way, my body wants to go there. Yeah. 
how much resistance do I have to going there? And to honor that resistance, like you would love your own child who's having an issue. Yeah. Rather than using it as a way to another way to feel <clears throat> about yourself, like, oh, <laughs> come on, feel this way. Why are you not? <laughs> <laughs> Or, or then you blame it on yourself or you blame it on the modality. Like, ah, this is Azu shit. It's not really working. Like, mm. uh, no, maybe you were rushing the process. Like it was an invitation to be authentic with yourself that you jumped over because it's painful to feel those things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And yeah, maybe there is something that you would really like to speak about maybe also unrelated to what we've talked about so far, but something that you're like really passionate about at the moment or that that's the, yeah, something you research right now or that you're excited about. Uh, yeah, I can share um, about what I'm researching about right now. Um, so I, right now we're in, we're in week, this Wednesday is week three of the certification training. Um, so, like half my time is it's the fourth year in a row that we've done it. So on one hand, you know, I kind of know what I'm going to do, but, um, and, you know, it's planned out <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I've done it before, but I'm always iterating on it and improving it and evolving it. Um, so there's that, there's like this constant, just constant R and D and, and, and iteration, um, Right now, for example, I'm I'm transcribing, I'm using AI to transcribe the earlier lessons. So when I teach something, I'm transcribing my earlier teachings on it and then asking the AI to critique me. Uh, what are what are what is its perspective on what I was doing? What are some things that I might have and I have a whole sort of script of perspectives that I want it to take to give me feedback on? And this has been enormously supportive and accelerating of my own development to be able to customize how I engage with AI to be like a high powered, brilliant feedback loop for the work. Oh, and I've wow. been developing this also for my client work. So I have Uzazu written down in a format that I can feed it to AI. I give clients now the option to allow me to record the sessions, I transcribe them and then I feed them into this AI and it gives me critique on myself as a facilitator, according to my own modality <laughs> of, of where I could be doing better. That's amazing. And what I might have missed. I, I haven't heard of that use of AI so far, but it makes perfect sense. It's like the AI coach. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm certainly not, there's, you know, major players in the health space that are all about this, right? Like therapy, AI is going to like ultimately put a certain amount of people out of work yeah. also in the coaching and therapy space. Um, for me, I mean, there's different levels to my vision on how to relate to AI in a constructive way. And one or two of them I'll get into in a moment. Um, but right for this piece, it's like, I'm kind of been in a position where I'm the one that arguably knows the most Uzazu <laughs> and, um, but the AI has the capacity if I've, to the degree that I've written it all out explicitly as a modality, which for the most part I have now, like Claude two can hold a hundred K context window. It can hold a, a, a like a, a medium to large size book of information of all of these aspects of Uzazu and all of these different ways that we facilitate it and then understand my session and then make incredibly insightful, like, ah, they said this, but you could have responded in this way and that would have had these options. And I'm like, right. And it's teaching me about some habits that I didn't realize I had, but now that I, now that it points them out, I'm like, totally right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And I, I just, I'm kind of a constant improvement geek and I'm also a, a, a compassion geek. Like I'm all about both of those things, like accepting yourself where you are and improving. But the constant improvement side of me is like really happy with this. <laughs> um, 
and that leads to the last thing I'll share for now, which is that um, I'm, I'm working a lot on this in my own way, at my own pace, at the problem of AI alignment and technology alignment. Um, I've been concerned about humanity, as many of us have, <laughs> and and the impact of technology on embodiment. And technology has greatly impacted uh, our embodiment. Um, yeah. And I could go into a long historical thing, but... Um, but just as an example, the printing press, the Gutenberg printing press, mm. all of a sudden stories were not told just around from person to person with body language around the fire. Now, instead of your uncle or your grandfather telling you the story, you're reading it in a book with words. Yeah. That's a huge shift in how information and culture and ideas are shared. That is, the printing press was one of the biggest contributors to the, the initial contributors to the mind-body dissociation. Mm. Language, firstly, but then mm. the printing press, right? So these, and that's not to make it bad necessarily, but just a, as a point of how technology again and again both empowers us and can disbalance us and the more that we learn about healthy body-mind integration and healthy body-mind environment uh, loops, then it, then it would be wise for us to ask the question of how can we design our technology to be supportive of how our system naturally wants to function so that we're not always just doing more and more therapy to compensate for a more and more imbalanced world that we're functioning in. Like we need to design and redesign around this. So it is imperative that embodiment experts, somatic psychologists lean into the tech space, lean into the AI space hmm. and let their voices and their wisdom be heard rather than polarizing from it. Like we need to be part of that conversation desperately. The world needs us to be part of that conversation. Yes. Amen. <laughs> so without getting into the more geeky details of it, I see Uzazu as being able to make a contribution to that. So I'm sort of slowly gearing up to engage a lot in the AI alignment space, in um, uh, human computer interfaces, because I mm -hmm. believe that the more that AI and human computer interfaces are, are offer affordances or ways for us to engage in a more integrated way, you get more of a positive feedback loop that is actually, imagine if technology was actually supporting mind-body integration rather than just causing disbalance and disintegration. Yeah. And it's possible where technology is to a point where it can handle these different kinds of inputs. We just need a, a framework and a shared language that computers and humans can speak that is multimodal. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing a um, conscious and yet uh, optimistic perspective. <laughs> Because many embodiment people that I know are like really super pessimistic about this. <laughs> so, yeah. Sounds Just like fun. environmentalists can, a lot of them can, can tend to be kind of like quite scared about global warming because they know the risks. Embodiment yeah. people know better than than most the embodiment risks of our current technology. So yeah. I, I, I very much empathize with their concerns. And the question is, so what are we going to do? Like say, stop AI, like good yeah. luck with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that never really worked so far. <laughs> Can we just stop technology? I know. <laughs> stop <laughs> progress. Stop it. Yeah, like not going to happen. So are you going to complain or are you going to be part of the solution? I mean, that's a little bit harsh, but a little bit like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, okay. hey. that's a bit where I'm at right now. Uh, yeah. A, a, a totally. very passionate side project of mine. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to, to hear about the out outcomes one day. So where can where is a good place to find more about you about your work to connect with you if people are interested? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, well, um, 
the modality is uzazu, which is u-z-a-z-u dot org. So that's the essential place. Why uzazu, by the way? Uh, simply because my original research was in vowel sounds and how vowel sounds affect thought, emotion, and behavior. So uzazu, it's named after the vowel sounds, which is mm. the dance of yin and yang, right? Mm -hmm. And then ah, yang. And then so this dance of contraction and expansion. Mm, beautiful. In case anybody was wondering how we got such a weird name. <laughs> it's a beautiful name. It also looks really nice when it's written down. <laughs> I know, I kind of, I, I still like it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I, did, I didn't want to name it anything too practical because I felt like it's it's going to take, it's going to be a journey of many, many years. And I, I don't want to, to understand the, the, the what's, what Uzazu is like, and I no. don't want to, I didn't want to project my own immature understanding mm. on the modality that was, <laughs> you know, like I'm, uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point. It's a great point. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's movement, there's contraction, there's expansion. It's good to be engaged with these type of things and mm. let's see, let's keep discovering what the value and the purpose is as we grow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dylan, thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. It's been lovely talking with you, really. Cool. Nice. Yeah. And goodbye to everybody listening. And thank you for your attention. It's, uh, I hope that this was uh, enriching for you in some way. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. I'm so grateful to Dylan that he shared a tangible demo of his work. If this podcast means something to you, I'd be so happy if you recommended it to your friends, if you shared it, liked it, subscribed to it. And please do get in touch. Let me know your questions, your thoughts. I'm happy to hear from you. And for now, I wish you all the best. Stay safe, stay sane, and I hope to see you back in two weeks. Mm -hmm.